Greetings and welcome to a new edition of the Massac Report. I'm your host, Carl Bodner, and our topic for today's discussion is podcasting. Joining us today are two of our regular panelists, seniors Catherine Simonik and Gretchen Bonofsky. Our special guest is Professor of English at Fairfield University, Matt Tullis. At this time, we will share our thoughts about this rather intriguing topic that's taking place in many schools, particularly at the college and university level. So let me ask, to, uh, Captain, why don't we have you start? Well, I thought we could start by just covering in general what we think podcasting is, and I'm sure you have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in response, in, in connection with that, uh, let me express my gratitude for you joining us. That's really important. and. You know, we understand that this is a new, not a new, but a respectfully growing mm -hmm. um, methodology for communication and for learning. And so that's why we feel it's so important to bring uh, public attention to this. Thank you. Well, I'm more than happy uh, to, to be here and thank you for inviting me. Uh, um, podcasting, you know, I'm, uh, I, 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 I like in my head to think that I'm new to it, but I'm not anymore. I've been doing it for uh, more than five years now uh, as a podcaster himself. Um, uh, but uh, it, it really is something that's growing um, pretty quickly. Uh, when I got started, there were very few people who were actually doing podcasts. Um, and now, they're 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 everywhere, uh, and uh, to the to the point where um, a lot of colleges are developing classes uh, on podcasting uh, itself. Uh, and Fairfield University, which is where I'm at, is no different. Uh, I just found out last week that that a class that I've created has been approved. Uh, uh, it's going to be called the Power of Podcasting, uh, and I'm going to be able to offer it in the spring of 2020. Uh, I hate that we had to look forward that far in advance when we're planning classes at the university level. Um, but uh, you know, the thing that I love about, about podcasting is um, it, it's just one more platform for storytelling uh, and for um, getting information out into the world. Um, and it's, uh, you know, you know the, the internet has, has made this um, so easily accessible uh, and Technology, uh, you know, has made it um, uh, rather easily doable. Uh, I was an old newspaper reporter, and the fact that I learned how to do audio recording and editing and and all of that type of stuff, uh, I thought was pretty amazing, <laughs> considering I was an old print guy. Uh, and so I think it's a fan, it's a really fantastic type of medium to um, to play to play around with. That sounds good. Definitely. Yeah. What about you, Gretch? What's your question? Well, that's actually interesting. We had actually had a previous massive report on newspapers and how um, they're kind of changing with time. So I ask you, as a former reporter, um, how, how has podcasting kind of uh, shaped your career in that aspect, from tra that transition from news to podcasting? Yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I've actually not been a newspaper reporter since 2008. Okay. Um, so it was, it, it's getting longer and longer ago. I moved yeah. into um, academia and bec I became a, a journalism professor for the first time in, in August of 2008. Um, uh, and then I started my first podcast in December of 2012, so about four years after I left newspapers. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have to think that it, had I actually still been at a newspaper, I probably would have started a podcast even, if, you know, I would have been pulled to that, that realm. And a lot of newspapers are starting podcasts. And that's, you know, one of the great things about the Internet is, I mean, a newspaper has to also have a news website. Um, and, and the podcast actually um, uh, is a perfect thing to, to include in that the kind of a... Uh, a, a new type of um, uh, of news uh, that you can add, a new type of delivery of news. Um, and I know even like my very first newspaper ever, which is a tiny newspaper called The Daily Record in Worcester, Ohio. Um, I think they have like a circulation of 18,000 maybe, so it's a really small newspaper. They've got a podcast uh, going on um, through, uh, through their website. Um, for me personally, 
Uh, the, my podcast, I have one primary podcast that I, that I do. It's called Gangry the Podcast. Um, as G-A-N-G-R-E-Y. It's a completely made up word. Um, <laughs> but uh, I started that podcast uh, and I interview national magazine writers um, uh, and book authors who do narrative journalism. So journalism that reads like it's a story uh, and not necessarily an article. Um, and I've done 70 episodes now and that has actually just doing that alone has made me a better reporter and a better writer because I've got I've had the luck of talking to the best in the business um, and learning from them uh, and so I can actually see how just from doing those interviews uh, and pushing those episodes out um, I can see how my own writing and reporting has grown um, uh, over uh, over the last five years um, it, but it's also helped give me kind of a name in not the industry but it's opened up some doors for me as well in terms of um, connections because um, now I know a lot of these people because you know I've gotten been lucky enough to talk with them um, and uh, at least in the world of journalism and in the world of writing um, having connections and, and you know networking with with people who are doing what you want to do is incredibly helpful as well so yeah I think it's a big boom for media in general as you said you started back in 2012 and back in 2013 I believe the subscriptions for podcasts actually crossed over 1 billion and I'm sure that's grown so much since then and as you said like it opens up so many opportunities and making those connections which is so important and how do you think that will transfer transfer into your students well the one way that it transfers into my students and this is the the probably I think the the best way that I think my podcast has helped um, because I teach I teach narrative journal I teach literary journalism I teach basic introductory news writing classes and feature writing and that type of stuff um, sports journalism I teach as well um, but the greatest thing has been uh, because I've been able to make these connections by doing this podcast um, uh, and I've, I've not been a horrible person in interviewing these people <laughs> they uh, and they, they, they value the fact that I gave them an opportunity to talk about their work and so they're, they've been more than willing to come in and and they will oftentimes Skype into my classrooms. Um, so uh, within my classrooms, I've had reporters from Esquire Magazine, um, uh, Rolling Stone, ESPN, uh, the magazine, um, uh, and a lot more. Uh, they frequently will Skype into my class and talk with my students. Um, they will uh, agree to do like one-on-one. -on -one. So I, in one of my classes, I make my reporters go out and talk with with these these. My, I make my students go out and talk with these reporters, um, one-on-one, -on -one and then write reports on them. And I've never had one of these people who've been on my podcast say no. You can't have your students contact me. Um, so I really, you know, it's it's been a great like networking thing for me. But I like to transfer that to my students because then they can reach out and start making connections um, within. Uh, within w the type of writing that they're interested in, um, and that's been phen phenomenal. Um, I'm lucky. I've got a, a report, or a, one of the editors from ESPN uh, is actually talking to my sports journalism class tomorrow morning. He actually lives in Fairfield, so but he's actually going to come in and and talk to the mm -hmm. class, um, uh, uh, which is pretty fantastic. I think it seems from what you're sharing with us that this is becoming a profession, in essence, on its own and a, <clears throat> a market on its own. And it's going to bring us to more comprehensive journalism, if I'm understanding things correctly. You know, it absolutely, for me, it's not a profession. I do it more out of a love, uh, and, and as part of my kind of my academic um, scholarship. I mean, you know, as a professor, I have to be doing some, some, uh, some research and that type of stuff. And so I get to call my podcast my research, which is pretty fun. But it absolutely is um, a, a profession for people. And there are, um, you know, people who are doing podcasts who are making, that's what they're doing. That's, that's their, their job now. Um, uh, and it is opening up new ways to kind of tell, uh, from the journalism standpoint, journalistic stories. Um, there's, there's one woman, um, she's a freelance reporter who writes uh, oftentimes for the Washington Post, um, she lives out uh, in in uh, the North Pacific Northwest. Um, but she did this remarkable um, uh, uh, podcast 
uh, on um, the, the Clive and Bundy family, uh, which they were in the news several years ago. Um, but she ended up doing this podcast. It, she wrote she wrote a written story. It was, I, I think, a, a four-part written story and then did a simultaneous se- seven-part podcast series um, that was all tied to it. And it was fantastic. And it was really an interesting way to look at um, this story in two different ways, um, which I think is also cool. Um, a reporter from the Los Angeles Times wrote a, a, a big series, um, but he also did it simultaneously as a podcast. Um, uh, but then when you look at um, uh, you know some people who w- have worked in public national public radio, they've moved into the, they're doing they're doing podcasts now. They're doing some stuff for for NPR and for NPR shows like that, but the primary focus of their work now is in in podcasting. Um, and I think the benefit is because it, you can deliver it anywhere, right? Because um, if you're doing something for NPR, you have to be you have to hope that somebody that that it will run on a station that people can pick up on their radio antenna, um, uh, uh, or that they're actually listening at the time that it's broadcast, right? Um, you know, okay, This American Life airs at 5 p.m. on W. Uh, SHU, right? Uh, and you know, and I, I, I made up 5 p.m. I'm not quite sure what time it airs because I am never listening to the radio at 5 p.m. Uh, but I can listen to their podcast version anytime I want, um, and, uh, and and so it's opened up a really new way of doing like old school radio in a lot of ways. Um, you know, when radio started out, it wasn't music. We think of radio as music now, right? right? When it started out, it was it was talking and telling stories and and storytelling and and they had the radio shows and Little Orphan Annie played on the radio and I only know that from the days when I watched the movie Christmas Story because that was way before I was born. But um, but podcasting has has brought this like kind of old school way of doing audio storytelling back. Um, and in a way that can reach far more people. Um, yeah, you, you, I'm sorry, but you mentioned the radio, and I'm, I'm, my mind is flashing back with pictures. I'm 72 years old, and so it's hard for my students or these students to comprehend the fact that I drove a car that only had AM radio. There was no FM. And it's like, no, that can't be true. You know, it's right. like it's got to be an impossibility. So I've had the retrospective benefit of, you know, histori- historically, looking back at this transition and expansion that you were referring to. So to me, it's marvelous. Um, But I do think it's important to relate some of that background, as you just did, to students because, you know, one of the things that I always did as the advice of my grandmother was every year you get your students, he spoke, spoke broken English, never had a day of school. So you ask yourself, what year are these children born? Now they have, you have idea of what you can talk with them about, mm-hmm. you know? And there's so much truth to that, and I did that every year for 51 years. <laughs> but it makes me, because otherwise, I can make an assumption, I mean, that they remember Bill Clinton. They know Bill Clinton exists, <laughs> but his presidency doesn't exist to them. Right. So it's a whole different thing. So uh, any question from you right now? I'm just thinking about how podcasting is uh, transforming like the world. Uh, would you encourage anyone who has a story to tell to like maybe not necessarily start their own podcast but to go on someone's podcast or or perhaps start their own even as like your own students yeah like, abso- how would they go about doing that? Uh, that yeah that yeah is? um I, absolutely i mean um it, it, it it's it's not hard i mean it, it, it you have to learn the technology mm-hmm. um but the technology exists to where i mean you could do you you could do a, a one episode type of thing where you're talking, you know, um, and, and you could do it without it costing anything. And that's kind of the crazy thing. I mean, is it going to sound like, um, you know, a professionally done one? It's not, but it's still a good, I, I think it's a good thing to do. And it's a good way to, to pra- practice this kind of um, uh, storytelling as well. Um, but I mean, you can... Uh, you you can record on your phone, right? And you can pull that over to um, a computer, a laptop, uh, and um, there is a sound editing, uh, an audio editing um, software called Audacity that is free, um, completely free. You can download it. 
um, and do whatever audio editing um, that you would want to do on, on that. Um, audio editing is, um, I used to think uh, it was impossible. I would never learn how to do it. Um, I was lucky when I started my podcast, I was at a university and my office at that university was in the campus radio station. Uh, and my, my, the professor who was in the office next to me was the radio guy. Um, and so uh, when I first started, he was the one who would produce. He would go and edit, do all the edits and all the production, add the music and that type of stuff. Um, but, but I would watch him and, you know, uh, it's actually not that hard, I think, to edit audio. I mean, it's really copying and pasting and cutting just like it is when you're working in Word. You're just working with, with sound waves. Um, and so you can do that fairly easy. It, it, you can do it in Audacity and it doesn't cost anything. And, and then, you know, finding a place to host it online so then you can share it, right? Um, you know, I use SoundCloud. Um, which is fantastic, mm -hmm. and you can totally get an, a free SoundCloud account um, where you can post a certain number of, of, of your own audio productions. Um, a lot of musicians are getting started on SoundCloud now. They're, doing their, they're producing their own music uh, and then putting it out in the world um, by using the, f the, the free hosting services of, of SoundCloud. Um, and so you can kind of do all of that fairly uh, I don't want to say easily, um, but, you know, in terms of really focusing on the story that you have to tell and figuring out the right way to tell that story to somebody who's listening um, and not reading, um, because that makes a difference. You know, if you're writing, when you're writing for the ear, you write differently than when you're writing for the eye. Um, and so that was, that's been a big thing that I've had to learn, especially when it comes to, like, when I'm doing introductions for the people that I'm interviewing. I have to, I have to step out of my, my long form literary journalist hat where I'm going to write big, long, eloquent sentences and write it in, in the broadcasting hat, which, which has to be more simplified uh, because, because people uh, are listening. They're not, they're not following along with their eye. But, it, but it's in, imminently doable. Uh, and then once you've got that link, you can share it and you have no idea what's going to happen after you're sharing that link, right? It, you know, um, it, at the very least, it gets out to the, the people that you know you want to listen to it, right? Family and friends. Um, and at the very best, it hits, it hits with a group of people and it starts getting shared even more than that. And, and then maybe it gets a much broader audience. But, but you, you uh, absolutely, I would recommend taking a shot at it and, 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 just, and, and seeing, seeing what it's like. Thanks. Catherine, what are you going to ask next? Well, I was just going to say that it's very interesting that you bring up SoundCloud and Audacity because I've heard of those and I just never would have thought to just go and use them in that way. Because SoundCloud to me, like you mentioned the radio in comparison, is for music only. Right. I never thought of it as for... Uh, it's a, it's a huge, it's a big, ho uh, there's a lot of podcasts that are hosted on SoundCloud. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of web hosting uh, services for audio files. Um, uh, Podomatic is one um, that's more geared towards podcasts. Um, I made the switch to SoundCloud um, several about three years ago, um, just because I liked. It made more sense for for. It was cheaper <laughs> for one thing, yeah. and it didn't have <laughs> limits on how much I could post. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not using the free account, but um, but I made that switch, and it's been really cool. Um, but you're right. I mean, awesome. primarily what most of what is on SoundCloud is music. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really any type of audio file um, you can um, you can post and and you know the, if you dig down deep into their um, categories you know they've got they've got you can categorize your work as storytelling you can categorize it as business information you can categorize it as um, lifestyle um, type of stuff so maybe if you're doing a podcast on um, uh, Nutri healthy eating, you know, I mean, you can totally put it on like categorize it under lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, um, and, and Audacity, actually, the first time I ever used Audacity, I was working at the, a newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, I was at the Columbus Dispatch uh, in Ohio, um, and I went out and I did an interview, um, and this is way back. This would have been in 2000, like late 2006, early 2007. Um, and I had one of those trusty handheld digital voice recorders, you know, because I didn't have an iPhone yet. I don't think iPhones existed yet. Um, and I was doing a story, uh, a nice big feature story on, on somebody uh, tied to the Columbus Zoo. And I recorded the interview. Um, 
And I sat beside the guy who did a lot of multimedia stuff, who did video type stuff, and he he asked how this, the the audio sounded. Was it good audio? And I played it for him, and he's like, well, let's let's take that and put sound bites, uh, and have that tied to the story online. Um, and he and I was like, oh, I don't know how to do that. And he's like, here, use this website called Audacity, and he showed me how to use it. And so that's the first time I ever used it, which is kind of crazy. Um, to think about. Um, yeah, you make it seem like it sounds so much easier than one would actually think. And since it sounds so much easier, do you think that it would be a good fit to have a podcasting program or class in a high school level? I think it's do eminently doable, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and when I say it was easy, uh, if I make it sound easy, it's because I've now been doing it like on a weekly basis yeah. for five years, right? Um, mm -hmm. Or four years, maybe. Um, but when you, but you know, it really like I was I was afraid of it, uh, of the actual editing. And I, I do my podcast. I use Adobe Audition. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. using Audacity because um, I mean it, it's it's a great free software. Um, but um, but I'm fortunate enough to be at Fairfield University, and they supply me with with the Adobe um, yeah. uh, stuff, which is a little bit more nuanced. Mm -hmm. um, but when I first started the podcast, I was deathly afraid of like trying to learn how to edit audio, right? And it was like imminently confusing to me. Yeah. Um, but then once I got over that and sat down and, and, and had someone show me how to do it, um, then it, it started to make, it didn't take long. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Let me pull Gretchen back in. Is this all as new for you as it is for me? It's or are you, new. are you familiar with it? And what is your take on all of this? Um, I'd say it's, it's new to me from learning about how podcasts come to be, but I actually am a pretty, a fairly avid podcast listener myself, more to humor podcasts, I would mm -hmm. say, um, such as one that a company called College Humor puts out. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's, it's very new to hear about how podcasts like come to be and how, like the intricacies of the whole process. Is this something that you could possibly foresee yourself making more use of as you go on into college and I'd be interested um, about pursuing this in college especially going somewhere where I'm gonna meet a lot of people with a lot of different stories to tell I'd be and um, not that it's boring that I come from Monroe but <laughs> no, I, I would I, like to I can know, understand <laughs> that <laughs> I would like to hear uh, where, sometimes you feel like you're in a say. cocoon exactly so like yeah, just, would just give yeah. you the opportunity exactly like I'm gonna to meet people from many, many different places, so. Really broaden your yeah. perspective of, of life in general then, right. from what you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I mean, are we getting to a point now where, you know, one could take several classes or major in podcasting? <laughs> and are, are we gonna culturally become someone who says, well, you need these credentials to do yeah, it. I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where you, where there will be a major in podcasting, but I, I don't know. Maybe maybe I need to start investigating that myself. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it, for me, um, I view podcasting from a journalistic lens because that's my background. Um, uh, and in that, es in that sense, um, it is one more way to be a reporter. And so that's kind of how um, uh, I look at it. I, 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 I see it in the same way that I see broadcast reporting to where you're going to teach someone to, how, how to go out and be a television, a TV reporter. Um, I view it in the same way that I uh, view um, magazine feature writing uh, and as well as, you know, investigative reporting. Um, it's just one more um, tool in the reporting belt. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it is also... Um, uh, you know, it, it, with all of those types of reporting, um, you have to report differently. You have to report differently. You have to write differently. Uh, and so I, I view it more in that sense. Um, but you're right. I mean, there are uh, the types of podcasts that there are. There are humor podcasts. There are comedians who, who have their own podcasts. Um, there are, like I said, lifestyle podcasts where people will talk about dieting uh, and that type of stuff. Um, and and I, I think with that you start getting down to the content and that type of stuff. You know what's what's included. Um, the the production end is still going to be the same. Um, uh, and and I think the production end will always be taken care of in one type of class, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and then once 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 a student knows how to handle the production end, then they can go and branch out into kind of any any type of content uh, that they want to focus on. 
You sparked a uh, thought in my mind. Uh, yesterday in the Wall Street Journal, I believe it was the Life and Arts section, they ran an interesting article about listening as opposed to being the listener. And, you know, uh, is, 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 are we in a position where podcasting can help us become better at listening? I'm just curious. I mean, do you think that would be an advantage? Because in my personal feeling in education, we've drifted away from helping students develop their listening skills. Everything is visual, visual, visual. And, you know, if you want to become a more democratized, communicative culture, you need listeners. And there's an art to that. At least I would agree with the Wall Street Journal that there's an art to that. Mm -hmm. I apologize for not recalling the uh, author's name. But I'm wondering, as young people with intellectual promise, what is your thought about that? Do you think from what you're experiencing and you look at yourself ahead, you'll become a better listener? Yeah, I could see how, especially with educational podcasts in certain subjects, they can help you become a better listener. I mean, I wouldn't want to take a physics lesson through <laughs> podcasts because I'm, I'm also a very visual learner myself. But at the same time, lots of video has a lot of distractions, especially and whether it's in the background or the primary focus of the video. So if you're just listening rather than watching, it might help develop those skills. Uh, two important verbs, listening versus watching. What are your thoughts? No, I definitely agree with that because I'm just sort of thinking about um, those crash course videos that yeah, we watch online for class. They are because they are based around visuals. Mm -hmm. So if you're not looking up watching it, you're not going to get the full like content that they're trying to give you. However, when I watch those videos, I want to take notes or try mm -hmm. and like look down and figure out my own little way to remember what I got to remember for the test the next day. I can't. I don't want to look up constantly at what he's showing me all these cartoons on the screen. So I think podcasts, like using it as an educational tool, would be amazing. It would work so well. And I think we will start to become better listeners, not just through podcasts, but through other um, medias that people are putting out, such as, like, not really media, but audiobooks. A lot of people are fans of audiobooks. And that requires you to sit down and listen to a book. Not read it, but to listen to it. And I think that helps you become a better listener as you're trying to catch everything that the character's doing and all that sort of well, stuff. Well, it's not reading with your eyes, but the brain is still reading, exactly. I would argue. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, thinking is a phenomenon that if you want to ask someone a super challenging question, ask them to define thinking. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, when we're, when we're infants, thinking and thought happens. We just don't know language yet. Mm -hmm. So that becomes very interesting. Was, I think we have to learn to use more of our senses. And my prejudice is that the listening and hearing senses have become more and more neglected. And I could be wrong. As I said, I'm you know a definite senior citizen here, so yeah. I'm dealing <laughs> with a lot. But I just feel I have such optimism about what your generation can do because there's not a day where I don't encounter a learning experience of my own, and I don't always convey my appreciation to my students and I think that's important to do yeah. you know I just uh, you know I would have loved to have been as tell as intelligent as you when I was your age mm -hmm. but it wasn't to be so <laughs> you know, uh, do you think also with with becoming a better listener and utilizing podcast in an, an arena of ways particularly in academia we become better critical thinkers and creative thinkers I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I think that can go a long way. I, I, so much of it is, um, you know, I, I think if you're really listening to something, whether it's a podcast or really a lecture or anything, um, then then you should the byproduct should be the good, solid, critical thinking type that that type of thing. Um, you know, with with. Uh, wh what I want my students to do uh, uh, when you know we listen to something, I, I want them to be thinking about what they've just heard and, and trying to then connect it with um, uh, any of the work that they've been doing that they've tr been doing as, as a reporter. You know, because you know when I play some, if I play a soundbite from one of my podcast episodes where I think that the person I interviewed said something amazing um, that needs to be shared with the students. Um, my hope is that with, as they're listening to it, um, uh, they're thinking about how they can 
adapt that to the, the type of work that they're doing. Um, but also, I think that's part of my job too as a faculty member is to um, uh, to push them to remind them that that's that's what they should be thinking. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think developing the good, solid, really be listening skills goes a long way in simultaneously enhancing critical thinking skills. Um, I know for me, if I'm uh, I, I actually don't listen. I used to listen to audiobooks a lot, um, and I don't. Uh, this was when I back in the day when I had an hour and a half one-way uh, car commute uh, to the university I was at. So I would be in the car for three hours a day, um, and I listened to a lot of audiobooks then. But one thing that I found is uh, I've actually gone back and reread a lot of those books that I had listened to at one point in time, and uh, I found that I would oftentimes drift. My mind would drift if I was driving somewhere, right, and listening. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so for me, uh, and well, I think the driving becomes a distraction. The driving is a distraction, right? So um, although that should that shouldn't be the distraction, right? <laughs> um, uh, so one thing, for, I, and I think I'm also kind of a visual type of learner as well. Um, uh, so I found actually that that I didn't think critically about the books that I was listening to, um, or at least not as critically as the ones that I actually read. Um, uh, within my hand, but then that's but that's me, and I know a lot of people, a lot of students who um, are, are auditory learners, and, and when they're listening, they're actually that's where their critical thinking is happening is when they're listening. Um, so I think I mean it goes a long way in in recognizing that I think um, everybody has kind of a unique learning style, um, and this and, and podcasting, you know, like this odd odd. Um, audible storytelling, uh, audible um, way of conveying information is just one more way to reach another type of thinker, um, which mm -hmm. I think is, is fantastic. Well, I, I'm going to ask the students, because uh, I'm out of the curious here, is obviously we've all become more and more aware, I guess, with tweets, primarily because of our president. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, uh, for me, podcasting seems like it has some validity, some reliability to it. I'm very hesitant about this tweeting stuff. As a young person, where do you stand on that? See, here's the thing. With our specific generation, I feel like we're growing out of Twitter. Would you agree with that? I do. Yeah. So I, like, I feel it. like more college kids use it right now. Not, e not even necessarily. Actually, there no. Yeah. Um, most of my students, yeah. very few of my students, actually have Twitter accounts. They've all moved to Instagram and right, Snapchat. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I actually I don't have one. Do you? I have one, but I don't use that. Yeah. I've used it in like five years. So it's funny. <laughs> like even though like our president's like um, on Twitter frequently. Frequently. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of the younger people are not. We're not really seeing that. I don't yeah. think. So do you think Instagram is a a better instrument? I like it. I like Instagram because it allows you to share a photo also with a picture. Yeah. Uh, so, excuse me. It allows you to share a photo with a caption, so that's words and visual together. Whereas Twitter is just the words. Yeah. So. I don't know if I would necessarily call it better. It's just yeah. what our generation has gravitated to. Right. And that's probably going to shift in the next couple mm -hmm. of years, too. Like the next I was just saying, yeah. there's the mystery. Yeah. What will yeah. be next? Exactly. exactly. You don't know. Like, we don't use Facebook. But exactly. Like, I use it for family, but right. that's it. Right. But Instagram's like the platform. I think right now, it's just a matter of shit moving with the platforms that are created. And I think right now, Instagram is a very good, actually, mm -hmm. platform for um, building your, your company up and advertising yourself. I think it's very good and for that. Ironically, right a lot of, of the high-end podcasters are using Instagram, which I thought, which I find highly amusing because when Instagram started, it was all about visual. Mm -hmm. So now you have people who do audio storytelling using a visual medium to kind of promote their audio storytelling, which I think is mm -hmm. utterly fascinating. No, definitely. So I, like, that brings me to... Um, the question of what do you think then is the future? Like, what do you predict is the future for podcasting <laughs> as far as being in school will be used in like all classrooms, or will it just be a big thing that we it will become bigger? You'll see some famous podcasters, like you'll yeah. recognize names. I wish I had a prediction. If I had a prediction, I could be a super rich man. <laughs> if I knew where it was going. Um, I think you know. I mean, I think it's going to be it's going to be like everything is anymore, right? It, we're going to cycle, um, and. 
Um, there's a lot of podcasts right now. Um, I, you know, truthfully, because I don't think because you, it can be done for relatively inexpensively. At least um, when I say re it can be done for it relatively inexpensively, I'm talking about um, the the podcasts that are interview based um, mm -hmm. uh, and not like hard in and I'm, uh, in depth reporting, like humor, lifestyle type stuff, where you basically can have one guest and you're doing that type of stuff is you can do for relatively inexpensively. Mm -hmm. um, and so for that, I think they will stick around. Um, uh, I think like everything else we'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll have a handful that become super pop popular and, and will be the ones that most of us um, recognize. But I mean, that's the way it goes, I think, for everything, so. My next mm -hmm. thought that has just been generated by your comments is I like TED Talks. I'm sure you students are familiar with TED yes. Talks. Is podcasting a comparison, a parallel to TED Talks? I mean, I think there are some podcasts that are similar, that, that address sim similar issues, and I think as TED Talks, I think, yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of, I find them kind of provocative. They really promote you into thinking, because you can have a dialogue with two people speaking, and you can have a dialogue with one person speaking, and the other person, the dialogue's happening in their in their minds. Mm -hmm. But I think that's really become an important thing. My curiosity question, the follow-up though, is if you were to be at MASIC one more year, what would you say if we went to the Board of Education and said, we'd like the board to allow some teachers with some student input to develop a pad podcast class? If it were to happen, or yes. what would I say? Well, if it were to actually happen and occur, I would utilize that. I would be there doing the podcast. How would I you convince them that this would be a good idea? Well, I would just explain how there are, like we said, different learning styles and how we don't utilize all of them in the classroom, I feel like, in the majority of our classes. It is a lot of just visual or just some words on the board, but that's still visual. Some people like to listen, but you make them write down notes and then they're not listening to you. Or they listen to you and they don't catch up everything that's on the notes. So I think to have something that they can access online that will be there for them, if it's a lesson plan or something, a teacher makes their own little podcast show explaining a topic that they're covering, I think that that would be well used. I think a lot of teachers would use that, especially a lot of teachers who do like to use a lot of videos because they are visual but you can also link your podcast I've personally um, in my experiences uh, when you look at the classroom environment the what I call the up down syndrome is a danger and that is what you're talking about and yeah. once that happens these get closed yeah so what would you say if we were going to be here one more year and we had a chance to go to the Board of Ed and you were going to say this is one big reason why I think we should have this. Well, I would have to agree with what Katie had said before. And just, I feel like just allowing kids to get um, kind of into the swing of podcasting in high school, um, even though like you're just starting the program in college, but even like bringing it to high school, mm -hmm. um, would just give people that much more experience going into it and allow them to become more familiar with the process. So I feel like that would be very helpful. Well, I'm going to have to close off our discussion at this time. And once again, I want to thank our panelists, Katie, Gretchen, and most of all, Professor Tullis. I want to thank you for joining us, contributing to our, country, uh, to our program. And we want to wish you continued success with your podcasting students at Fairfield University. Uh, also, I finally want to thank our audience and hope that they will join us again at our next edition of the Massac Report. Thank you.